So let's have a look on the I3C interface. So we will have a quick overview what the I3C is, uh, what are some new features, uh, and uh, how it's compatible with the I2C. Then, yeah, we will have a look what um, uh, what are the let's say advantages, disadvantages, and then we will have a short quick demo with the LSM6 DSO sensor, which is gyroscope accelerometer sensor from ST that supports the I3C. So quick introduction to the I3C. It's a MIPI standardized protocol, and it's uh, designed to improve or overcome some of the I2C limitations such as uh, limited speed or need for external signals for interrupts. And the name I3C stands for the improved I2C. As on I2C, we have uh, two wire uh, interface. So we have two signals, SDA and uh, clocks. With the I3C, we have now a new naming. Instead of master slave, we have a controller and uh, target. So on the bus, there is always some I3C controller or named primary controller, but in more advanced applications, there can be more devices that can take this uh, role. And uh, it's compatible with uh, I2C with uh, some limitations we will talk about later. And it's uh, defined by the MIPI specification and the basic specification with the basic features is available for free to everybody who registers on their website. So it might be more open than the I2C and the more people might uh, adopt it. Now, what are the new features? So one of them is uh, pull driving. So the I3C allows to switch to the push pull drive. And this, uh, so in the old uh, I2C, the speed was limited by the open drain bus. So if we wanted to go to the higher frequency, we needed to reduce the pull up size on the data line. That meant we need to increase the drive capability of the devices and uh, we can then face some uh, speed limitations. So I3C allows to switch to push-pull drive when the ar arbitration is done. And with the, in the push-pull, we can achieve up to 12 and half megahertz. So that's uh, basically the same speed as a full speed USB. It still uses the open drain, and this is uh, during the arbitration. So when, when it starts communicating, it's uh, running in the open drain. We'll later also see uh, why there is this uh, arbitration. OK, uh, so this uh, also requires that the I3C controller needs to control this uh, pull up. So in uh, STM32H5, when you set up the I3C peripheral as controller, there is embedded uh, pull up resistor that is switch on and off uh, during the communication. And the clock signal is also driven in the push-pull mode. So that means we cannot use the clock stretching. So for example, if we would want to use some I2C slave in the legacy mode that uh, uses the clock stretching, we, we cannot use it. Another new feature is uh, dynamic address assignment. So you can assign different 7-bit uh, addresses to the targets, which can work as a priority on the bus. And also there is this process of uh, discovering the devices on the bus and assigning these addresses. So we read some uh, sort of unique ID. It's 64-bit. Uh, and based on this, we assign the 7-bit address. And we can also assign these addresses based on static or I2C legacy addresses. So, for example, we could do this with the sensor we will use in the hands-on because, of course, uh, at least in the current time, all the sensors that support I3C will probably support I2C as, a, as an option. The I3C also uh, introduce uh, common command codes. So, this, these are some standardized commands you can send on the bus that has described uh, format. So it allows to do some operation in a standard way and you don't need to study the, the sensor data sheet to know which uh, data to send to do some common tasks. That's also good. In the, we have the in-band interrupts. So 
This allows any I3C target to initialize communication on the bus and send some notification to the I3C controller. So that is also one of the reasons we have the arbitration header. So some other devices can start communication at the same time. And uh, we have the dynamic address assignment to select if we have multiple devices that allow this invent interrupt to configure the priority between these uh, devices. And we can also send some payload with the interrupt, which for example, can be the timing control, which is another feature that uh, describes how the timing should work if we get some notification from a sensor, but there could be some communication ongoing. So there is some latency between the event happening and on the controller side receiving the interrupt. So there is some described mechanism how to calculate this uh, latency. There are some more advanced features. I don't think those are that uh, interesting. Uh, so you can assign group addresses. So you can have a sort of a multicast. So then you can send the common command codes to group of devices. Might be useful with uh, many devices on the same bus. Then there is a hot join mechanism. So that is when, for example, you are in some low power mode and then you power up and power up some sensors or additional I3C targets. They start this hot join request and then the I3C controller assigns them address and basically restart the enumeration process. And secondary controller is that you can switch the controller role to some different device. So that was from the theory. So the I3C is uh, compatible with the I2C, but there are some limitations. So you might need to be careful when using this. One of the points is that not all I2C slaves will follow the I2C specification. Also the I3C in the high speed relies on 50 nanosecond spike filter to be implemented in the I2C slave. So it will send a shorter clock pulses than 50 nanoseconds. And since there is the filter, the I2C slave shouldn't see it. As I mentioned before, the clock stretching is not allowed and uh, certain addresses are reserved for I3C. And also the I3C targets might have uh, still the I2C mode, which might require some configuration during the startup. Also the I3C basic specification has some nice table that compares a different feature with the compatibility. So you can have a look there what uh, some of them might limit some functions. Some of them might uh, break the compatibility completely. So why to use the I3C where we can have a higher data rate. We can reduce the pin count using the in-band interrupt. We can achieve a lower power consumption because we switch to the push-pull mode and we don't need to fight with the external pull-up on the bus. And we have some standardized uh, commands uh, for basic operations. And also uh, the I3C allows to add additional data lines. So we don't have it this feature in the H5, but this concept allows in the future to extend the bandwidth on the bus. And also it allows double data rates, which are also not support in the H5, but it's uh, another possibility to increase the bandwidth. So there is some comparison of the speed from the specification. So here we have the SDR, which we use on the H5. So here it should correspond roughly uh, to the 12 and half megahertz. Then we, when you switch to the double data rate, uh, you get going to get up to twice or even more speed. What might be challenging at the moment, so compatibility with the I2C might depend on the devices you want to use on the bus. So the higher frequencies might lead to some issues with signal integrity. If you are running, for example, 400 kilohertz I2C bus, you don't need to care that much about the trace lengths and parasitic capacitances. It also requires some initialization at the beginning and might be a bit uh, more complex to to I2C. Sorry, there is a mistake. And uh, 
yeah, it might not be that uh, available at the moment, but that might change in the in the future. There are different kind of uh, transfer that can happen on the bus. We will not have a detailed look, but uh, just to summarize them. So we have a private read write command. So this is like, for example, accessing the sensor registers. You read write directly to the device. Then we have uh, some specific common command code commands. So it's uh, assigning the dynamic address or uh, resetting targets. So these have some special timing constraints. Then we have the I3C uh, regular command codes. So we can do a broadcast to all devices. Of course, this can work only for write and or we can issue the, this command to a specific device in a read or write mode. We have the inbound interrupts. Then we can use the legacy I square C transfers. So this one will be done only in the, in the open drain mode and uh, hot join request and controller row request. So just to have a quick look on one of the transfers. So for the private write. So for example, we are writing some data to the sensor. We can uh, usually we start from here. So here is the arbitration header. We send some reserved uh, byte in the open brain mode. Then when we receive acknowledge, we uh, issue the repeated start and we are already uh, switched to the push pull mode. And then it's quite similar to the I square C communication just in the push pull mode. Also the acknowledges are a bit different. So for example, in the write mode, uh, it will send a parity bit. We can also skip the arbitration header, but that that, uh, for example, requires that no other device will issue interrupt. Or we can start from previous transactions. So we had some previous communication. We don't need to go to the open drain mode again. We just start from the repeated start and uh, write the data. So I think that is all from the theory. Now uh, we will go to the practical part. So what we will use is we will use this uh, extension shield Xnucleo IKS01A3. So it's a extension board that has uh, many different sensors on it. And uh, one of them is LSM6DSO. So that's the sensor that supports the I3C. Unfortunately, this board is mainly targeting I square C. So there are a few things we need to do. First, we need to remove these jumpers to disconnect most of the sensors from the bus. And uh, the other thing is there are level shifters because most of the sensors operate at 1.8 volts, while the board will run on 3.3 volts. So these uh, level shifters will also limit the maximum frequency we can use on the S3C, but uh, we will be able to demonstrate some of the features uh, such as the in-band interrupt. So we will create a simple demo project. We will use the in-band interrupt feature to get some notification from the sensor and to configure the sensor to work properly. We will use the Xcube MEMS extension package. So I will now uh, switch to the cube IDE and we will start with uh, creating a new project. So this might take some time. Okay, so for this project, we will uh, select the board. So it's a um, low age six, uh, yeah, five, six, three. And this will also do some configuration for us. So I will click on next. I will type F3C demo. And I will click finish. And here I will select the S to initialize peripherals in the default mode. It will reduce the the number of steps we need to do the the configuration. Okay, so we have this running. 
Okay, so we will start with uh, I3C configuration. So in the connectivity, you should see here the I3C. So on this bigger H5, we have one I3C instance. On the small one, the H5.0, we have two instances. And here I will select the controller mode. And I will configure some parameters. So here I will switch to the mixed uh, bus. So although we will use only I3C, I will use this to help me with the timing because we have the level shifter inside and we want to avoid the small pulses. So I will also set the duty cycle to 50% and we will in the code uh, copy this timing for the uh, I2C square to the I3C. So unfortunately at this moment, the Cubemix will force us to use basically a good timing for the I3C, but one that assumes there is the 50 nanosecond field in the legacy I2C devices and having uh, really short pulses on the clock line. So we need to avoid it due to the level shifters. Uh, that's uh, all in this part. I will switch to the interrupts and enable both interrupts because we will use them in the project. And now I need to also configure the GPIO pins because I want to use the PB8 and PB9. So here I can either use the feature here that I will hold control and click on the pin to move it there or I can click here and uh, select the function. Now I have uh, both uh, pins here and those are on the Nucleo board on the I square C on the Arduino header. And I think that's, yeah, that should be all for the I3C. Now I will, at the bottom part, I will configure PA14 as a XTI input. So I will configure some peripherals that the Xcube MEMS package will use, but we will not use it really in the application, but it's required to configure the package. So that's uh, this one. And also I need to go to the GPIO and enable the corresponding interrupt in the NVIC. So it's the XT line 14. And uh, now I will configure the I square C2. So again, this is just for for the package to be included without issue. I can use the default pinout and configuration. Then uh, I will use uh, USART3, which is already configured for printing some data. So I can leave it there. The same is basically for the iCache. Since we started from the board with peripherals in default mode, we have it uh, configured. And now I will configure the Xcube uh, MEMS extension. So I will go to the software packs and select components. And here you can see different kind of uh, extension packages. And here I have the MEMS package. So you can see I have it already downloaded. And uh, from here, I can select some demo application. So I will resize this to see it. So I can select some demo application for this IKS board. So this is the one we have, the LSM6DSO and wake up. So we will use uh, this demo. Now it uh, complains, so we can have a look uh, here. I think there should pop, pop up some message that basically tell us to enable the board part so it should be yeah this one board extension and now there is the green so it's okay you can click okay and now here in the middleware tab uh, i will see the xcube mems package I enabled uh, both parts that I selected previously, and now I need to configure some peripherals to the package. Uh, so here I will configure the interrupt from the sensor, which is PA14. Then I will select the button. So I have it already configured from the board. Similar for the USART, or we use it in the UART mode, but 
the peripheral is u star, so we need to select u star here. Here we select the I square C, but we will override it in the project with the I3C C and we select uh, the green LED. And uh, one last thing before we generate the code is that in the project manager, in the advanced settings for the I3C C init, we will change this uh, checkboxes. So we will not generate the function call because we will call it from the MEMS package and we will uncheck this visibility so it will be visible outside the main C file. And uh, we can generate the code. So here you have the steps in more detail, but uh, I think I can skip to the part where, where we copy the code. So here is the, we will create a new source file with this uh, code. So if I go back here in the core uh, source, I will create a new source file. I think, uh, what was the name? Uh, yeah, I3C uh, rec IO. Okay. And I will copy the code here. I need to do uh, the same thing for the header file. So this is uh, basically the like a BSP for the I3C. That overrides the the I square C, and we will go through it at the end of the hands-on what is uh, done there. But at the moment, we will just copy the the code here. And okay, and one last modification should be in the MEMS target. There is the configuration file, and we will use some a bit uh, trick to redirected to this uh, i3c rec io files we created to use those functions so if i click uh, here i have the thing i need to code uh, to place in the user code section and uh, that should be all so i assume in the future we will have a new xcube mems package that will support this uh, out of the box so you could use the i3c directly but now we are using uh, this uh, dirty trick okay so i have the board here you can see that i don't have the extension board connected so you can now try to download the code and there should be some error messages uh, from the code because we will not uh, get to the enumeration uh, state. So. I resume. I Yeah, I see the enumeration fail, so I will now quickly disconnect the board so I can plug the extension shield. Okay. So even if you don't have the extension shield, you should see some messages there. And uh, now if I connect and do a reset. Yeah. OK, I forgot one more thing, so uh, I need to do one more modification here in the main file because I need to change the timing for the I3C as I mentioned before. So we want to use the same timing as for the I square C. So I just overwrite these two lines. So I cannot set it now in the cube MX. So. And this is due to the level shifter. If there was no level shifter, it would uh, work properly. So now if I download it. Resume it here. OK, now I see I uh, done the enumeration successfully. Can put back the, the board and the demo here is that uh, it detects vibration and turns the LED on. So it's like, a, uh, for example, with mobile phone, if you pick it up, it will light up and wake up. So if I like tap on the table, the LED should be blinking. 
So this is basically the demo from the Xcube package. So maybe we can go uh, just quickly through the code that is here. So at the beginning we have the MS BSP I3C in it. So here we initialize the I3C. Then we start the dynamic address assignment. Here we also reset the dynamic address. So if we would, uh, uh, because the sensor can has some address assigned from previous uh, running of the example. So we reset that and we wait for the enumeration. And if it's done successfully, we configure the device for the invent interrupt. So maybe this is also I can show you that really the interrupt is coming from the I3C peripheral. If I put a breakpoint here and I run it, so so far I don't have the interrupt, but if I tap on the table, you can see in the debug it's coming from the I3C1 event interrupt handler. Then if I remove this, yeah, I will get the blank on the LED. And so then we have some uh, callbacks for the dynamic address assignment. So when we detect some new device or we don't detect any new devices, so we finish the process or we don't receive any acknowledge, then we can at least print the enumeration failed. And then we have the read and write registers. So if I start with the uh, read register, it's uh, we use a low layer here because it's uh, simpler and Actually, the peripheral is quite easy to use, so you basically set up what kind of transfer you want to do. So in this case, we do uh, the, we do private write, and then we transmit the data. And here it's one data for the register address, and then I switch to the read direction. So it's a, like a new transfer, and I read from the device. Here I check some flags if there is some error. In this part, I I know there is a FIFO inside, so I don't need to wait for some flag to before I write the data. The similar is for the write register. There is just one small hack that uh, the Xcube MEMS will disable the I3C feature in the sensor because it expects it use I square C to avoid some errors. So. We just uh, we know that if uh, write to this specific register, we will modify the data. So just to summarize uh, some takeaways from this hands on. So the I3C is faster. You can basically compare it to the full speed USB at the maximum uh, frequency. It reduces the pin count because we can use the in-band interrupt. It's a more open standard because the basic specification is available to everyone, so we might see more uh, easier adaptation in the, in the market. It's compatible with the I2C with some limitations, and uh, there is some. Uh, it can be extended in the future. So, in applications where you would need more bandwidth uh, in the future, you can put more data lines or uh, switch to the uh, double data rate.